Have you ever seen something that you cannot explain? A whisper in a silent corridor, or perhaps a spectral figure lost in time? Join Unit 522 and I as we venture into the realm of the paranormal. Number 1 Before I begin this story, I would like to mention that yes, it is 100% true, and I have only told it to a select few people that I am very close to. At the time of this story, I was 17 years old working a part-time job at a local movie theatre. I absolutely loved working there. The managers were really laid back, and the employees were super fun to work with. Me and my two favourite ushers worked the same evening shift, 5.30 to 10.15, except I was the closer, so I had to stay and work sometimes until 1am. One day when we got to work, there was an ambulance and a big part of our lobby had been roped off. We all sat upstairs waiting to clock in, wondering what had happened. After we'd clocked in and got downstairs, we spoke to someone that had been working the day shift, and they told us that unfortunately, a man had died earlier that day whilst watching a film, due to a suspected heart attack. The whole event freaked us out, but left us a bit curious. Deaths in our area like that weren't very common, and it was quite disturbing. Funnily enough, this happened when the movie Ouija was just about to start playing in our cinema. And this gave one of my friends the bright idea to try and use a Ouija board to contact the man that died. At first, I was very much against it, not only due to my strict religious beliefs, but also because I thought it would be disrespectful to the man. But my friends were very persistent and convincing, and in the end I'd said I'll give it a go, but if things turned south, I would be out. So a few days later, once my buddies were finishing up their shift and I was on closing, one of them went home to get the board. The managers were downstairs sitting in a different office doing their own closing routines. I rushed through mine, and then they got back with the board. When we started our session, my buddies kept asking questions, but got absolutely no response. It was a bit disappointing. Then I tried a question, and I got a response straight away. From the start, I thought it was my buddies just messing with me, but I would be proved wrong very soon. I asked it a question, what's my name? And it answered. Then I asked it another question, what was the name of my girlfriend? Again, it answered correctly. But before I could say anything else, it gave off the name of a guy. At the time, it didn't make sense, but months later, I found out that it was the name of the guy my girlfriend was cheating on me with. I must also clarify that this guy was from out of town, far out of town, and none of my two buddies at the time had any idea that my girlfriend was cheating on me, or who this guy was, so there is no way that they could have answered that. We went through various other personal questions, and at that point I was pretty convinced this thing was legit. But things only got worse. We started asking about the man who died, and the board answered our questions, but towards the end of our questioning, it began to act quite strange. Long story short, we soon found out that we hadn't gotten a hold of the man that died. Instead, we were communicating with a dark entity. And the most haunting part about this was that it only answered to me. Before we were able to finish the session though, we heard a manager walking up the stairs we quickly hid the board 
and my two bodies hid in a closet. The manager came in, didn't notice anything, and after a quick conversation with me, went back downstairs and said goodnight. Little did I realise that we had forgotten a crucial part of the Ouija experience. We forgot to say goodbye. I actually never realised it until the very next day. And that's when things started to get bad. The next day was a Friday, and my parents had to go out of town for a softball tournament with my sister. I hadn't thought any more of last night, and around 5 o'clock, I was sitting in my living room watching The Office. It's easily one of my favourite TV shows. When out of nowhere, the mood and feeling in my house changed. It's as if all the happiness had been sucked away from me. About as soon as I looked up, I witnessed a chair from my kitchen being thrown across the room. I was in an absolute panic. I ran out of my house, grabbed my keys and wallet, and went off driving my car. I had absolutely no idea what to do. So I went to the Walmart closest to my house as it was a public space, so that I could gain composure. After about half an hour of pointlessly wandering through the aisles, I decided that I needed to get whatever it was following me out of my house and out of my life. I spent the next hour and a half at a Starbucks, researching all the things I could do on my phone. Luckily, at my local mall there was a game store that sold Ouija boards, so I decided to buy one. I knew playing alone was actually a bad thing, and I contacted my buddies to see if anything strange had happened to them, but they told me that nothing had happened. So I decided it was just me and this entity. I took this back to my house with the intention of ending it then and there. A lot happened whilst I was playing around with the board, and I probably spent about 45 minutes talking to it, this thing that was now attached to me. I spoke with it back and forth, and due to my religious beliefs, I refused to give up against it. At one point it said, sell soul, but I refused. I said my prayers in the house and called out to God to end it. Towards the end, there was silence on the board. I took my hand off the piece to Google what silence meant to see if I'd gotten rid of it. And as soon as I took my hand off the piece, it flew independently straight to goodbye. I then knew that my mission was complete, so I cut the board up into seven pieces and buried it outside my house. Like I said, I never told anyone, not even my parents, but I'm happy to say that nothing strange ever happened again. Please don't mess with Ouija boards, they're not toys. Number two. I once had a friend I knew for about five years. I met him when I was 11, and he was around 19 or 20. Despite the shady age difference, he never did anything that would make me think he was a creep. He was protective, yes, but in a fatherly type of way. My father was deployed to Iraq when I was 10, so he was like the substitute while my dad was miles away. We usually would talk over Skype, and we would talk for hours at a time. I had a friend who also talked to him, but not as often as I did. Almost about a year ago, he died in a car accident with his cousin in Europe, and of course, I grieved. It wasn't often I would cry over anything, but this was something that hit me hard. This is only a little backstory. So I've always been someone who has trusted their gut, and strangely enough, even my dreams. It may sound crazy, but I've had small harmless dreams, which I experienced the same thing a couple of days after. Well, one night, I had one of these dreams. I didn't remember much. I was outside at someone's house. We were jumping around on a pile of junk, and we were just having a good time. There was a fallen tree against the pile. I don't recall much from the dream, mostly just the scene I was placed in. Of course, it didn't bother me. It wasn't scary in any way, so I didn't worry about it. A couple of weeks later, my mom suggests that I spend a week or two at my cousin's house, who lives out in the country. Of course, I accept this offer, 
since I wanted to get out of the house for a while anyways. That weekend I headed down to where they live. They had a huge yard with a silo and a worn down hog barn. Right next to the hog barn was a large pile of metal, sticks, rugs, and basically a bunch of trash. Next to that was a tree. It was split in half, with one half leaning against the scrap pile. I didn't quite think of the dream, since my memory can be pretty bad at times. So I just saw it as normal. The first week goes by, and my cousin suggests that we go outside for a bit. I agree. Finding nothing else to do in their home, we head out. We walk around for a bit and talk, before making it to the scrap pile. I was the one who suggested that we climb around it. We both climbed up to the top and found cozy places to sit. I sat on one of the branches of the broken tree, and she sat further across the pile from me, on an old rolled up rug. I can get pretty hyper at times, and it makes it hard for me to sit still sometimes. So I started bouncing on the branch some. Of course, a 160 pound girl bouncing constantly on a branch is going to make it snap, and that's what it did. I tried to grab onto whatever I could, which was a small twig on the tree, which snapped easily and sent me falling. I fell straight on my back on an old gutter that was facing down. The sudden events left me in shock and unable to move. I was slowly rolling off the gutter. Below was a thick piece of metal. A sharp jutted part of the metal was sticking up and was surely going to impale me if I continued to roll over. As I rolled though, I felt someone grab my arm. They pulled me back to balance on the gutter, and I was able to sit up and safely balance myself. My first assumption was that it was my cousin who had helped me. I was about to thank my cousin for practically saving my life, but I realized she wasn't even halfway across the pile. Her foot fell through a screen and she couldn't get to me in time. Apparently I had rolled myself back before I rolled off, but I swore I felt someone pull me back. Someone who saved me from being impaled and getting severely injured, or worse. I immediately told my aunt about this, and soon my mother. My mother agreed with me that it could have been anything, but I'm convinced that it was my father figure, that he was watching over me. I still contemplate about what happened that day. Number 3 Five years ago now I was driving home towards Chelmsford, England. It was the middle of winter, probably around midnight, and my girlfriend was in the passenger seat. There is no moon, and the road is unlit and empty, and I am enjoying the drive. I'm pretty much flat out on a long right-hander coming out of a roundabout. When I notice, there is a girl in the middle of the road. She is tall, skinny, and dressed head to toe in black, with a long billowing skirt. She had long black hair and was facing away from me with her arms by her side. Like I said, I'm going pretty much flat out, so it all happens very quickly. I swerve into the opposite lane, just narrowly missing her, and hit my brakes. In my rearview mirror, she is momentarily lit up by my brake lights, and again is facing away from me, but still is in the same spot with no sign of movement. I am very spooked, and instinctively get off the brakes and back onto the gas. I could see her silhouette recede into the mirror. My girlfriend didn't see a thing, because she was asleep at the time, but is startled awake as I swerve. I circle around the roundabout, and there has been perhaps 15 seconds since I last saw her in my mirror. I wanted to show my girlfriend to prove that I wasn't crazy, but as we get back, there is no sign of her. There is no path near that part of the road. It is on a slightly raised embankment through farmland. No reason for anybody to be there, especially at that time of night. And there is absolutely nowhere to hide. I am not religious nor superstitious in the slightest, 
but I have absolutely no explanation for what happened then. I had a pretty vivid night terror about the same girl some months later. I woke up and she was tapping on the window. Then she was in the room, but had no face. Number four. My friend's sister Guinevere was moving and had to drive her truck from Denver to the East Coast. She stopped in St. Louis on the way to visit some friends, leaving their place just before dusk. She started driving in what she thought was the direction of the highway. The sky was getting darker, the streetlights were few and far between, and she suddenly realized that she was lost. She was in an industrial area now and was getting creeped out by the fact that no one was really around. Railroad tracks ran behind the rows of empty buildings. Since this was before GPS and decent cell phones, she decided to pull over into a parking lot and check her actual map. Guinevere pulls into an empty parking lot and stops, switches on her interior dorm light, and no sooner had she done this, a African American woman appeared at the passenger side window out of nowhere. She said, You need to get out of here. You're not safe. Guinevere went from creeped out to shocked immediately. She stammered, Uh, thanks, and floored it all the way over to the other side of the parking lot and stopped again to look at the map. Immediately, the young woman was there again at the passenger side window. She says, You need to get out of here. You're not safe. Guinevere tore out of the parking lot and eventually made it safely to the highway. Two things that especially weirded me out. One, she had two dogs in her truck, not afraid to bark at strangers, and neither one of them registered that there was anyone outside at any point. It was like there was no one there. I've always heard that animals have more sensitivity to paranormal things than people do, so that was odd. And two, when the young woman spoke, Guinevere said that she could hear her voice plain as day. Even though the windows were rolled up, she heard the young woman just like you would hear someone who was sitting right next to you. She was so bothered by what happened that she did what she could to search the St. Louis newspapers online to see if anything had occurred in the area. It turns out that a man had been killing women right around there and leaving their bodies near the train tracks behind the building that she stopped at. He would hide nearby and watch while the police and emergency personnel worked the scene of his victims. He had struck again that night, just before dusk. She believes to this day that someone, fortunately, was warning her not to linger. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I want to give a huge thank you to Unit 522 for helping me in this video. He is an extremely talented narrator, and if you haven't heard of him already, you should definitely check out his amazing work, he's one of my favourites to listen to. Also, part 2 of this collaboration can be found over on his channel, with even more chilling paranormal stories so be sure to go check those out with the link coming on screen in a few moments. But before you head over, I'd love to know if any of you guys have ever experienced something paranormal. Let me know in the comments section as well as your thoughts on this topic. Do you guys want more paranormal videos? Because I have lots of stories if you do. If you want your story read, be sure to send it over to my email which you can find in the description. And don't forget to check out my Twitter and Instagram, as I'm posting some cool behind the scenes stuff there. But for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in part 2.